Praise God. Praise God. Are we happy to be in God's presence? Oh, wow. This one is, I'm happy that every one of us are very energetic today. Amen? We have this letter from, to New Dimension as a card, and it's from the Christopher family. Say thank you for yours, for your love, support, prayers, and encouragement during this time of loss and difficult. Elder Franklin Christopher. Amen. As most of us know, he lost his elder brother and went back to home to funeralize him. So we are grieving with him in this difficult time. Please continue to lift him up in prayer. And um, about the sick and the shutting, I want to encourage the church to keep on praying for them. You know, when you scan the bulletin, you see the sick and shutting there. You know, when in your free time, call, you know, pray for them. They are not, their names are not there for fancy. Praise God. So we have the bulletin, right? You can, when you come in, you see the QR code. Just scan it and you say it. And please do make the calls. And if it's in the bulletin, we have attached the phone numbers of the sick and the short in. So it's easy for you, just in case you don't know them, you don't have their numbers. So you can easily call them. It means a lot to each and every one of them whenever you call and check up on them. And also want to announce on behalf of the Family Life Ministry that we, they have started the, what I call it, Couples Hangout every second Tuesday on Zoom platform. If you are there the last Tuesday, it was really, really nice. So I also encourage all of us to, if you are married, dating, dating to marry, not to take for anything else, you should come to the program and you will surely be blessed the pastor will not be around today and um, he succeed your prayers please remember uh, put him in your prayers by next week he's going to be back and then the singles ministry sister Leslie Lesania Headley needs your help all are married make Male and female, 21 years and older, please re um, receive and complete a short survey form from the ushers today. And lastly, I also want to encourage each and every one of us to join the prayer line. Something happened this year. Towards the ending of last year, you know, the numbers in the prayer line was dwindling. But after the 10 days of prayer, like we had like double, sometimes triple of what we normally have before. And, you know, I thought maybe after the 10 days of prayer, some people might go out. But we didn't drop that much. People kept, kept on coming all the time. So I want to encourage everyone here, if you have been coming, keep on coming. And invite your friends, 
invite your loved ones, and sometimes your enemies. Bring them to the prayer line, and it's a good it's a good place for all of us to pray. And not only in the morning prayer, also come to the evening prayer. And if you see any church that prays together, they always flourish together. Amen. Praise God. Don't forget our AY and Bible class today. Now, is the anyone celebrate a birthday this week? Anyone celebrating a birthday this week? Or someone on the line celebrating a birthday this week? I know somebody must be celebrating birthday somewhere be on the line. So at this point in time, I'm going to call on the praise team to sing a happy birthday to those who are celebrating their birthday this week. Those on the line of God, a any anniversary? Oh, and the Lord will grant us many anniversaries. So this is time for us to welcome one another. I want us to be on our feet as we welcome each and every one of you. You know, New Dimension will be nothing without the members. You know, we can welcome the visitors. We also welcome every one of us here. If you're Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Ah, we're not fasting today. Praise God. Yeah, much better. So we want to welcome everyone here. First of all, is there anyone who is worshiping now for the first time? Any visitor? Okay. Wow. Welcome. Ah, sister. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> we want to specially welcome you to New Dimension Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are pleased to have you here. Could you please stand on your feet? So, uh, wow. Welcome, minister, to our church. So you can be on your feet as the church will come around and welcome you in our midst. Amen. And as you welcome her, also welcome one another. Praise team. Thank you.
please stand for the platform party? is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherein he had girded himself. The world is also established that it cannot be moved. The throne is established of all, thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. Thy flood have lifted up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. The testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. This is our call to worship.
Praise God. Come have our seats. Amen. Today, you know, it's truly a privilege to welcome a committed public servant and a passionate champion of our community. So on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Obi Borgin and his wife, I invite you to join us in welcoming our esteemed, honorable speaker, uh, our future, future speaker, I guess. <laughs> honorable Jeffrey Hakims. He's uh, a congressman, the minority speaker of the House of Representatives of the US, U.S. Congress. Praise God. So on this point in time, I'm going to invite Congressman to come over and address the sense. To the distinguished pastor in his absence, to First Elder Chibuki, to the other uh, distinguished elders of this great church, New Dimension Seventh-day Adventist Church family, good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It's good to be home in Brooklyn. And as many of you know, whenever I'm home in Brooklyn, I like to be amongst the people of God. Uh, and I found over the years, no better place to be when seeking to be amongst the people of God than the SDA church. And so what an honor and a blessing to be able uh, to stand with you on today, to worship with you on today. These are a very challenging times here in New York City, in our country and throughout the world, but we serve a good God. And we know that the church has been and continues to be a shelter in the time of storm. Uh, we know that windstorms can't stop us. Uh, we found out that earthquakes can't stop us. Uh, Donald Trump can't stop us. Uh, we're thankful that the church is a shelter in the time of storm. And as I prepare to take my seat, let me just simply say, down in Washington, we're going to continue uh, to work hard on your behalf and to put people over politics and to fight for the things that matter like lower costs and better paying jobs growing uh, the middle class making sure that we can live in safe communities building and preserving affordable housing and also making sure that no one touches your social security or your medicare not now or not ever i grew up in the cornerstone baptist church i I'm still a member, and so I recognize that while I serve in public office, ultimately we answer to only one authority, Almighty God. The scripture says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. And so while it's the government's job to perform, I'm thankful on today that Jesus Christ has the power to transform. And because we serve such a good God, I'm confident that in our community, in our city, and in our country throughout the world, the best is yet to come. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Praise God. You know, I'm far from retirement, but it's nice to know that when it's my turn, I'll still get the social security. Amen. Thank you, Congress. My, I know I, I, I look very young, but it means a lot to hear those words. Amen. Praise God. And I want to let you know that you're always welcome to come to our church any day, any time. And the sense will always welcome you with open arms. Amen. Can we be on our feet as we. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for how you have led us thus far. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here to seek your face. Lord, I pray and ask, O oh God, that in our lives, in everything that we do, that you will have your way. Go before us and make every crooked path straight. Lord, empty us of every self and anything that will hinder you from fully working in our lives. Have your way in today's fellowship. What you have ordained to achieve in the life of everyone here today, let it be achieved. And let the gates of hell never prevail against it. 
have thine own way, O God. I lift up the congressman into your hands, be with him and his aspirations and his work with you. Lord, use him, O God, to bring about your perfect way in the country. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. standing for our opening hymn, hymn 163, At the Cross, At the Cross. Amen.
boys and girls. Have you ever seen or done something that was unexpected? Or perhaps you've seen things that did not seem to go together? For instance, maybe you have worn plaid pants with polka dots. Now, I don't see anything wrong with that, but some people don't like that combination. Or maybe you've seen a cat and a dog that were really close friends. You wouldn't expect them to get along together, but sometimes they do. Well, how about food combinations? Imagine I had some vanilla frosting. What might you expect me to put that on? Maybe a cookie or a cupcake, but what if I put it on a pretzel or a cracker? It might seem strange, but when I gave it a try, it wasn't too bad. When I put the frosting on the cracker, it transformed it. The sweet frosting made the saucy cracker pretty sweet. You know, love can do the same thing, making something sweeter. In the Bible, Jesus talked about some unexpected combinations that can cause us to feel a little confused. Jesus told people that we should love our enemies and pray for people who hurt us. That doesn't sound fun at all, does it? What does this mean? Well, God wants us to be kind to others, even those who are not very kind to us. Anyone can love someone who loves them in return, but when we are able to be nice to people who aren't so nice to us, that truly demonstrates the love that God has for us. Jesus died for us when we did nothing to deserve it, when we were still sinners, so we should show that kind of love for others around us. Now, this doesn't mean we should just never stand up for ourselves and let people beat us up all the time. It's important to have boundaries, and there might be people who we don't want to hang around with too much. However, we can still pray for those people. Sometimes, you need to keep a little distance and handle it with care and prayer. We can act kindly and graciously and pray for others, especially since we don't know what they might be going through. When we do this, when we exhibit kindness to those who aren't so kind, and when we pray for others and offer a smile where others may frown, it can have a remarkable impact. Those opposite actions can change people. Sort of like spreading frosting on that cracker, our kindness can sweeten even the cruelest of salty people. It might not seem like the natural or expected response, but it can be more powerful than acting mean in return. It's also what God would want us to do. There may be times when others don't change, and that's okay. God recognizes all that we do, and he will and already has given us all we need. We remember the grace he has given us through Jesus and pass that on to those around us. And if we have a hard time showing love to certain people, we can always ask God to help us with that as well. He's always there to bless us and be with us, and he will grant us aid to love others. An amazing Bible verse that talks about this is Luke 6, verses 27 and 28. It reads, But to you who are listening, I say, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, would anybody like to pray for us? Dear Jesus, thank you for everyone you put in the world for us to be here. And bless us as we be in church. And bless us from the hands of Satan. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So... So thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for blessing the whole church. Thank you, God, for making the whole people smile and have so much fun. All the kids love Jesus. The, the, the kids the kids have so much fun. The kids have a lot of blessed times. The kids love each other. They play each other. They they. They could play whatever game they want until it's bedtime. And then when it's school, they have to go and listen. Amen. You can go back to your seats now. Please stand for the re reading of the word of the Lord. Today's scripture will be taken from Psalms 13, verses 1 through 6. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? 
How long shall it take? I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he had dealt bountifully with me. Scripture read it. Scripture reading continues with Romans chapters 8, verses 28 through 34. And it reads... And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. We shall, we then, say to these things, If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us all. God bless. Good morning, church. As I look on your faces, I see faces of expectation, and we can only have that expectation from God. We come because we know we have a God who hears and answers prayer. And so this is our time of prayer, and I want to thank God and welcome also uh, Congressman and his team. We welcome you to New Dimension today, and it's time is our time of prayer. And I know it's nothing new for you, Congressman and the others, so we all can pray. So I'm going to give everybody one minute or half of a minute so that you can lift your faith to God, and then I will pray. So your 30 seconds begins now. We thank God. We will now, as we listen to our praise team, just listen to the words of this song. And as we listen to the words, we know that we have a mighty warrior. And he's warring for each and every one of us. You know, my must say before the praise team start, we have a God who doesn't look at faith. We have a God who who doesn't look at creed, religion, is a God for every one of us, to the greatest, to the least. And so we have a wonderful privilege to come before this sovereign God. It is a privilege, my brothers and sisters, because when this breath of life leave us, we don't have such a privilege. So listen as our praise team, sing our prayer song, and then I will pray. Praise team. Take it out. You can be seated in the meantime. I see some persons might be feeling. Jehovah is your name.
the Lord in prayer. If you're not able to yield, that's okay. Kneel, that's okay. You can assume what position feels comfortable. Mighty God, our rock, our fortress. We thank you for such a privilege, God, to come before you in prayer. We thank you, dear God, for being our mighty warrior. And as we come to you, dear Father, nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to the old rugged cross we cling. Lord, so are our faces, so are our needs, dear God. They are varying. But I know, dear God, because of your sovereignty, you are able, Lord, to hear each heart's prayer. You are able, dear God, to meet the need of every prayer. You are able, Lord, to differentiate, Lord, what you need to do for each and every one of us. Some of us, Lord, have indeed various wars that are going on in ourselves. Wars, oh God, in where we live. Wars in our home, dear God. And so we thank you for being a great warrior. A mighty one, dear God. And we pray that you will take charge, Father, of these battles that we have to fight. Dear God, we thank you, Father, for those who might be having financial needs at this time. Father, you have been the greatest provider. So I pray, mighty God, that you will meet them at a point of this need. Father, help them financially so that they can take care of all their financial needs. We thank you, mighty God, for being protector. Lord, you have been protecting us day and night. You have been our covering, Father, throughout the days of our life that we are here, Lord, and we can worship you on this blessed Sabbath day. We know, Lord, that we have sinned before you. But we thank you, Lord, that you are God who says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, God, I thank you for cleansing us, for washing us, oh Lord, as we lay our sins at your feet. Mighty God, we thank you for today again. We thank you for the one who has chosen to bring the word to us today. We ask, dear God, that your Holy Spirit saturate this place saturate every person within the hearing of the voice of your servant on the airwaves um, also. We pray for those who are on YouTube, on Zoom. We ask you, dear God, to meet them too at the point of their need. We pray, dear God, for this community that you will continue to let your word flow in and out. And as we, Father, living in this community, the lives that we live, will be able to let someone know that there is a living God and they need to serve him. Lord, we thank you for such an opportunity again. Continue to minister unto your servant today. And the words that he speak may bless our hearts. May we continue to see you high and lifted up. We thank you for what you will do today, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray. And let the church say,
rightfully belong to the Lord, a faithful tithe, and a free will offering. The question is, how much belongs to the Lord? It says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the earth and they that dwell therein. How much of our income is holy unto the Lord? And it says, all the tithes of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is holy unto the Lord. And concerning the tithes of the herd or the flock, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord as our deacon and deaconess. Come forward as we collect our tithes in the free will offering. And for those who are viewing virtually, we can also give at www.newdimension.org or zell us at ndtreasurer1062 at gmail.com or by mail at 1062 Winthrop Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11212. And let us also remember that we are still in our building restoration project, so you too can also contribute. this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you an overflowing blessing that you will not be room enough to receive it let us pray our father and our great God we are so thankful for life this morning thank you for waking us up this morning in our right mind we thank you for the six days that you have provided for us as we go out and work and provide for our family but on this day your holy Sabbath day of rest we return what is rightfully belong to you. Thank those who are able to give this morning and those who are able to give. We pray that you will provide for them because anything through you and with you is possible. Now bless the tithes, bless the offering. May it help in the furtherance of your work. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name. Good afternoon, New Dimension. Uh, we can do better than that. Come on, we can do better than that. Come on. Good afternoon, New Dimension. Great, great, great. Amen, amen. How many know that we serve a great God? Amen. Oh, I don't think y'all believe it. How many know that we serve a great God? Amen. All right, that's our first song today. God is great, and He's what? And He's what? Greatly. To be praised. Amen. Give God glory. Shows his unconditional. 
when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. Amen. How great thou art. Hymn 86. Hymn 86. How great thou art.
Amen. Love that fourth verse. Then Christ shall come. He that come shall come. And will not what? He will not tarry. Amen. Are you Lord, amen? You bring life. You bring life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. Hey! 
take we take real advantage of just doing this. We take real advantage of just breathing. Because it's so natural. And let you in on a little secret. We were supposed to sing this song a few weeks ago. And when I thought about it, I, I thought about Sister Maxine's testimony. I think she suffers from sleep apnea. Some, somewhere around those lines. And she told the testimony and and she said her husband was watching her. I think something along the lines where her husband was watching her sleeping. And she, oh, was it like two minutes that she wasn't breathing? Two minutes. Shavuke. How much, how long can we survive without oxygen? And I've heard and I've heard stories even worse where they're watching their their spouse and you know sleep apnea you snore very loud so you, you just wake up Woo. look at them they look at them and there's there's nothing moving for minutes at a time So when the song says, it's his breath, the Bible says he breathed into man and man became a living soul. Please don't think you woke up because of your alarm clock. Because in an instant, because of God's grace that we have that breath that he gave us that he put us in this perfect environment that he gave us that we are in the perfect atmosphere that we can breathe freely and not don't think you too big OJ just died. 76, gone, just like that. You might think he lived a full life, but, but you don't know when it's your time. So while we have the breath, God praise, amen.
God is great in this building. If you are thankful for the breath that he gave you this morning, I want you to stand up on your feet and give God a praise. Give God something this morning. He didn't have to make it here today, but God covered you and made sure he made it. You made it through the week this morning. Give him glory. It's because of his mercies we were not consumed. We got to give God praise. While we hear the, the scripture says the rocks will cry out. I don't want a rock blazing for me. I can do it. Give God the praise he deserves. Amen, amen, amen. Give God glory. Praise God. Praise God. Are we blessed? Today is one of the shorter sermon. It's a very brief one. But I'm terrified to preach it. When I spoke to Pastor yesterday and told him about the topic, he smiled and said that need addressing. And I'm terrified because I'm also speaking to myself. The topic of our, of our sermon today is very brief, is forgiveness. And our text is taken from Genesis chapter 45. But before we read, I have seen many people get married. I'm an ordained minister to or wed people, official, official marriage. And I've seen all kinds of bride. I've seen slim ones. I've seen fat ones. I've seen 600 pound ones. I've seen one with no leg. I've seen some with, that are blind. I've seen some with severe acne. I've seen some with short hair. Some with long hair. I've seen some that the dress they are wearing is doing everything within their power not to tear. All kinds. But what I've never seen before is a dirty bride. I've not seen a dirty bride. A bride who is not clean, who is not neat. I've not seen that. But I've seen all kinds of shape, form. I've seen those that, you know, the Lord did a good work in their life, to say the least. Now, In our Christian work, nothing stains your garment more than unforgiving spirit. The same way a, a groom, if you're standing on the altar waiting for your bride to come, when you see her from afar with all the elegance, you know, you're so happy. But if the, the bride comes in, and uh, the glory that follows her is not a good one. When I mean glory, you know, when you enter New York City transit and you see a homeless person, there's a glory that follows them. You know, you know it is a homeless person. So imagine if your bride comes in and then all of a sudden you, you, you perceive some, some similar glory. You'll be so disgusted. You can forgive her for being 700 pounds, but not being dirty. Yeah, even a thousand pounds, you might forgive, but, but not dirty. So in the same way, as a Christian, nothing stains your garment more than unforgiveness. So today, we're going to go through this lesson about unforgiving spirit and being able to forgive. Let us open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 45. I read, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all, before them all, and stood by him and cried, Cause every man to go out from me. 
and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh had it. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. You all know why they were troubled, right? And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Making this even worse. We'll come back to this text. You know, outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, this is the best story on forgiveness in the Bible. You know, their brothers, we are a very different type of brothers. It is one thing, growing up, I'm the eldest. So, in African culture, the first son has a lot of power. Now, if you're a first son that is a male, like the first son who is the first child, that's like double power. So, now, I was, I'm privileged to be the first child who happened to be the son. So, I had all the powers in the world. So now, in the house, I'm like a little prince. So I told my parents, listen, going forward, I have my own room. All my brothers, I have three siblings, plus myself, and we are all boys. So I told my parents, listen, I don't share room with nobody. I'll have my separate room. My three brothers will share one room. And then, of course, the parents will have one room. And to tell you how prevalent it is in my culture, my parents didn't object to it. I got my own separate room. All my brothers had one room, and nobody dare come to my room. Now, oftentimes when we, you know, fight over some things, I will make this kind of comment. I will kill you. I will deal with you. And they knew that I would do something. So they always obeyed. But as my brothers became older, they knew that I was bluffing. So when I say, I will kill you, say, yeah, which hand? Leave me alone. <laughs> but Joseph's brothers weren't were like me. <laughs> when they say they will kill you, they will kill you. They killed an entire city because of what they did to their, their sister. So they were mass murderers, and they planned to kill Joseph, and Joseph knew they were not bluffing. Now, you know your story is bad when slavery is, was the better option. And he was sold to Egypt. That was a good option because if he stayed, they would have killed him. Now, oftentimes we go through that story and we reduce it to if you keep your cool and trust God, God will answer your prayers and you become the prince of Egypt. Really? That's not, I don't think that's the, you know, we watch many Hollywood movies. We are very familiar with story acts, you know, character development and all that. But I don't think that's the case in this particular story. The reward was in chapter 45 of Genesis. In chapter 41, you see what went wrong. Now, if you are of the opinion that his reward was being the prince of Egypt, let us go through that to a logical conclusion. He was faithful to his father. What happened? He was sold to Egypt. He was faithful to Potiphar. What happened? It was thrown into prison. He was faithful in prison and got and stayed even there longer. And then he was he was finally brought to Pharaoh to Pharaoh. Now, when he stood before Pharaoh, it was a, a stark contrast to what would have happened to him. Now, Joseph was supposed to stand before his father, but look at he's standing before Pharaoh. He was supposed to be clothed with the coat of many colors. He was clothed with the clothes of Pharaoh. He was supposed to be in the presence of his father, but he was standing in front of Pharaoh. Now, you know, Abraham made his servant to swear not to give his son a pagan wife. But look at Joseph being rewarded with a pagan wife. Now, to make matters worse, his name was even changed. Now, that doesn't look like a reward. But 
if you read through the story, you get to 45 when his family met the brothers. And they were so terrified. Now, we live in the US. And there is one forgiveness that many people like here, especially if you are a millennial or Gen Z. That is forgiveness of student loans. You know. Now, imagine the president announcing that your loans are forgiven, but you have to work for one million hours. <laughs> you know that that is not an actual forgiveness. It's like a transaction. We as humans are very fond of transactional forgiveness, not full forgiveness. Now, what is it? What's the meaning of forgiveness? What's the true definition? Forgiveness is not just mere, you know, waving of punishment. It's an absorption of debt, saying that what you owe me, you don't owe me again. And you're not looking for ways to extract it back. So is that if you use like um, a trader or a merchant, for example, you know, back in our various homes, I don't know about you, but back home, the economy used to be so bad that when you look up, you see rock bottom. That was how bad it was. So people had to go and buy things on credit. So you go to the person selling rice and say, listen, give me this cup of rice. When I get my salary at the end of the month, I'll pay you. And then you go to the person selling the beans, the same thing, the person selling the fish. Before the month runs out, you are owing more than the salary itself. Now imagine where you go to the person and the person says, don't worry, I forgive you of all the debt. You'll be very relieved. But if I tell you, okay, after forgiving all the debt, you tell him, listen, now, but send your son or your daughter to come and work for me. You know, that is not a real forgiveness. You just exchange services. Forgiveness is not postponed punishment or a spread out punishment. My parents were very famous for that. You would do something bad in school and you come and bear forgiveness. And they look at you and say, I forgive you, but it was torture for the rest of the month. I didn't like that kind of forgiveness. It was not genuine. Now, most of us have a lot of unforgiven spirit. A primary example can be seen between spouses. You know, one person annoys you, and you are like, mm, I'll not forgive. You go to church, and they speak all the tongues, prophesy to you. In fact, when you came, the cloud, a pillar of cloud came down, but nah, your heart didn't change. And you feel that if you forgive the person, something, something bad will happen, like as if you're letting a person off the hook. Now, not forgiving someone is like drinking a poison and hoping the other person dies. It's just, it's just like you. In the same way you can't take medicine and expect another person to recover, in the same way you can't drink poison and think another person is going to die, you have to wholeheartedly forgive people. Now, there are other examples you can see in the church. Example can be seen in depriving your parents' honor if you're a child. I know some people that their parents treated them so poorly when they are small. Now, when they grew up, they were like, nah, I can't forgive them. Now, when they, they went to church and pastor preached a very hot sermon, and they said, okay, I forgive, but I won't come and see you again. I forgive you, but you can't see your grandchildren again. I forgive you, but no pictures. I forgive you, but no card on your birthday. I forgive you, but there's always something attached to it. You see some people say, I forgive my sibling, and then their siblings send a letter to them, and they like open their mail. Hmm, letter from Sister Ruth, no, trash. 
they don't bother to open it because they still have some grief in their hearts. Another example is you rejoicing because of someone's suffering. You're just saying, hmm, that serves her right. She got that cancer because she's like this to me. You got that accident because you're acting like this. That means you really have a very bad heart. Forgi unforgiveness is like you say sinning because someone sinned against you. Now, we have to break this thing down a little bit. This is a very short sermon. We have to come here, believers and non-believers. Now, if you're a believer and you choose not to forgive someone, what are you saying? You are saying to God that, God, I know that you died on the cross of Calvary for this, my this person, but your death is not enough. Come and die a second time, in fact, the fourth time. That for me to forgive this person, it requires your death plus a silent treatment from me. That will even it out. That's what you're telling God by your unforgiving. You're telling God, listen, I know you left heaven and the Romans dealt with you and you are crucified. And you paid the price for this, my brother or my sister. But it's not enough. They need this. They can, they, they can receive that forgiveness from you. But I will not pick their phone calls again. Now you say, okay, maybe I can choose to forgive believers and then go to unbelievers and then don't forgive them. All right, what are you telling God? You're telling God that, listen, this is my brother, this is my sister. Even though you have planned hell for them, eternal destruction, that is not enough. They need hell, eternal destruction, plus my silent treatment. You see how does it make any sense? So you have no reason whatsoever not to forgive one another. Now, and that point we have to get across is that no, write this down, no human relation can last without constant forgiveness. It is impossible. If I is a human being, it is impossible for you to have any kind of lasting relationship without a constant forgiveness happening on both sides. We're going to end with this. The myths of unforgiveness or the myths of forgiveness. Number one myth is that you only forgive when someone has asked you for forgiveness. That is false. You can forgive without somebody asking you for forgiveness. Amen? Now, this myth is rooted in the fact that most people think that they are capable of confessing all their sins. I have never met anybody who was able to confess all their sins. All we end up with do, we we'll, we'll confess in groups. Lord, all my sins. Because if you are listing your sin one after the other, <laughs> I think even a 30-year <laughs> mortgage is not enough. You, 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 will, you will stay a long time. So you, you, you just group and say, Lord, any sin. So you didn't confess it. You just group everything and say, God, you know, anywhere I've sinned against you, have mercy upon me. And God in his infinite mercy forgives you. Now, in the same way, you do not need someone to come and ask you for forgiveness for you to forgive them of their wrongdoing. As it's happening, you're forgiven. Now, forgiveness is a one-way street. It doesn't require two people. You can do it all by yourself. Amen? Praise God. And remember, forgiveness is not giving up your rights to punish the person. You didn't have rights in the first place. 
you forgive because it is a commandment from God. And every day you go on your knees and say, God, have mercy upon me. And the Lord's Prayer say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There was one day, my, don't laugh, but back when I was still a young prince in my house, my brothers, you know, they did me wrong. I used to have a nice slippers, very nice slippers. We'll call it sandals over here. So during the course of play, it, it broke. Now they told me, I'm sorry, brother, forgive me. I told him, okay, I forgive you, but I want your own slippers too. In my mind, me not forgiving them means that I will not beat them. I won't retaliate. That's what I meant. I'm, I'm, I'm forgiving you. But I also demanded some kind of compensation. That was a very selfish way to go about it. Now, I learned forgiveness in, a, in its true depth back when I was in med school. I needed money so bad. And I called my dad. And I'm like, listen, I've given you enough money for the semester. Why are you calling me? I wore dust and ashes, pleaded my iniquities, say, forgive. Okay, after going back and forth, no headway. I said, okay, that is what happened. Borrow me the money. My father looked at me and laughed. Okay. He borrowed me the money, lent it to me. So first to say to you today, I've not paid back. But when I got good grades at the end of the semester, and did, it was excellent, I showed him the result. I said, okay, Dad, please. Uh, he said, what will, what will I do for you? I said, I want you to forgive me of all the debts. He forgave me. But, you know, in a true sense, that wasn't genuine forgiveness. I got a good grade, and he forgave me. Fast forward. Because anytime you take money from my father, he will call a house meeting and tell everybody that you took money from him. So when the younger one became in that college, I needed money too. You remember the, the other brother, what he did? He came and said, okay, that please, okay, borrow me this money. My father said, who are you? He said, ah, you did it for him. My dad obliged and borrowed him. But his result wasn't as good as mine. So he couldn't use the results to ask for total pardon. But he had to ask my father for forgiveness. Then my father said, okay, I forgive you for all the debt you owe me. I looked at it. But I had to get good grace to get my own forgiveness. But he didn't. But that is the way God works. You don't have to get good grace for God to forgive you. God will forgive you. At first, you're sincere in that forgiveness. You're asking him. He will forgive you. In the same way, you shouldn't wait for someone to be on your good graces before you forgive them. And that myth is that forgiving requires you to forget. That is a lie. Now listen, if you are able to forget what someone did to you, you need to come to hospital. We have a word for it. It's called amnesia. And it's not good. You hear that word say, forgive and forget. Nah, you forgive and remember. The fact is that it is not forgiveness if you forget about it. Imagine that you are owing somebody $1 million and the person had an accident and couldn't remember you are owing them. Will you say the person forgave you? No, they didn't forgive you. They can't remember. It doesn't mean that they forgave you. <laughs> when your children find out, you be sure that you go to court. So you are not expected to forget. When Joseph's brothers came and said, and he introduced himself to them, what is the first thing he said? Hi, is my daddy, right? 
Did he forget what they did to him? He remembered every single detail. And that's what makes forgiveness powerful. Forgiveness that you remember every single thing, but you voluntarily chose to let it go. That makes it powerful. Now, I'm not saying you should go and borrow money from people so that they'll forgive you. I'm just giving you the concepts in the scriptures. So, when you are feeling pain of what somebody did to you, it's part of the process. When you finish forgiving the person and somehow you see feel the, you see feel the grief, what the person did to you, that doesn't mean you didn't forgive the person. A classic example can be, you know, I work in the hospital. There was this patient we had. That they got into altercation and someone pushed him to the train and the train kind of hit his leg and they had to be amputated. Now, the person that did it finally came and they talked things over and he forgave the person. Do you think that he forgot how that leg was cut off? He knows it. The fact he remembered it, does he mean he doesn't forgive you? So when you hear forgive and forget, nah, that's not, that's forgive and remember. But with time, the, the memory doesn't have the same stain in your life. We have point number three and the fourth one we close. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Most people confuse both. Forgiveness is one way, but reconciliation is two ways. A popular example, let us use what we know. A few weeks ago, we saw in the news that a bridge in Baltimore you know, was destroyed. Now, forgiveness will be the U.S. government saying, ah, the insurance, the sheep people don't have to pay anything. We'll take care of everything. You don't owe any financial obligation. That is you forgiving the debt for you know, destroying the bridge. Now, even though they don't charge you to court, take you to court, or sue you to take money out of you, the bridge is still down. Even if you are forgiven, reconciliation is two-way. That means two people are working hand in glove in order to repair what was lost. Now, if the government forgives them of the financial penalties, somebody has to still come and fix the actual bridge that was destroyed. That fixing the bridge is a consolation and requires every hands on deck. But forgiveness, you can do that all by yourself. Another, exa another example can be infidelity in a marriage. If a, a spouse teaches on another spouse, and the other spouse says, I forgive you. Yes, truly, in their heart of heart, they forgive you. But for you to fully reconcile, there's a process. Now, you, there is counseling, there is, you know, you try to avoid characters or behavior that led to the first place. There, there, there's steps you have to take. Now, you can forgive somebody and the person refuses to reconcile with you. And that's okay. God will not hold you captive for that. Example can be if you are abused. Maybe a, a, a lady who was abused by an uncle or something. And then when, even though she forgives the uncle, for you to actually reconcile, every time she comes to the uncle's house, she's very careful with her female child because you know what the uncle can do. That doesn't mean she doesn't forgive the uncle. But they, are, they did reconcile. And you can play that in many aspects of life. If some people do not want to reconcile with you, leave it up to God. But in your own part, forgive, but don't forget. The last point is forgiveness makes everything better. 
that is false. It doesn't. That is why the Bible says, when they, they ask Jesus, how many times will my brother offend me before I start forgiving? What do you say? 70 times 7. There's a reason for that. If you're fighting with somebody and during the course of the fight, the person threw a blow and your teeth fell off. And when you smile like this, it was a gateway to the <laughs> stomach. Even if you say, I forgive you, the pain of the tooth is still there. The person can say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you say what? I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. But Lord, your mouth is still bleeding. It doesn't make things better. And it's okay. You feeling the pain doesn't mean you didn't forgive the person. But you, know, you understand that it is part of the territory. Some things just will hurt you. But with time and with the grace of God, the pain will keep on going down, down, and down, and down. If you don't forgive, you will run into what we call compound sin. I'm sure all of us like to invest a dime and get a million dollars back, right? You know, when you turn on your TV or your YouTube page or other stuff, you always run into this advertisement about people who promise you how to make 10x your money, 100x your money, and all those stuff. Then you invest this amount and you get this. Now, if you don't forgive, you will have similar result, but in the opposite. Now, if someone wrongs you and refuses to forgive, it will pile up. Now, it does not add, it multiplies. So, when you do another one, it will not be one plus one, it becomes one times one. To keep on adding, multiplying, until one time you just explode. So, to avoid you reaching that point where you explode, it is very important to forgive every single time. Now, this happened to me. My brother wronged me, I forgave him. He wronged me again, I forgave him. He wronged me. I didn't forgive. And then he wronged me. I did not forgive. Then he wronged me the third time. I went back to the two I forgave and he took back my forgiveness. And when he wronged me the other one, I used the anger of all the previous ones I forgave to come back. I felt bad afterwards. And I had to give him my meat. So back then, don't laugh. You know, in America, there's so much meat. If you just go to Costco, meat everywhere. Back home, I only ate chicken Christmas and Easter. Boy, that was... And then if you took first position. You know, it was so important that when you take first position in class, the greatest award you can get from your parents was one full chicken. So anytime we took for man, we can't we have to dream about the chicken. A nice chicken. So for me to give up my chicken, that was like a huge sacrifice to me. Now in America, I hate the chicken now. But you know, back then it was really precious. I gave it because I wanted us to reconcile. Even I told him I forgive you, and he forgave me. But to make things good so we can be brothers again and play together, I had to walk towards a consolation, which required me to give up something about myself. And he knew how much that chicken meant to me. But see, brothers being brothers, he couldn't finish it by himself. He still called me and gave me a little portion back. I was so happy. In the same way, when you willingly and freely forgive people, it has a way to come back to you. And people willingly forgive you. Now, one thing we have to know before we end is this. There's a phenomenon in medicine whereby people are 
not sensitized against themselves. I'll give you an example. If you have a body odor, your nose will perceive it the first time, and if you keep if you don't take, take care of it, you'll be like, hmm. If we continue telling him that we, this is bad, we get overwhelmed. So your nose becomes desensitized to that smell. And you think you're okay. But when under the train, everybody leaves you. Like, what happened? Ah, they don't like the glory you carry. Now, that principle manifests itself in, in, a, in the religious realm in the sense that when, somebody, when you do somebody wrong thing, in your mind, it's just this. But when someone do you wrong thing, in your mind, it's a very big thing. You can see that at the work. You will wrong a coworker. Say, why even complain? It's just this thing I just did to you. And that coworker will do something even less than it, that you did. Like, can you imagine Mr. A? He did this big thing. We magnify other people's sins and we diminish our own sin. Even if you're not careful, you can even see it in your marriage. If the husband did not wash the plate, like a cardinal sin. But you nag and nag and nag and nag, and the man is like, oh Lord, and say, forgive you. So, don't try to play, oh, your sin is big, but my own is small. No matter how small or how big, always forgive with your entire heart. Now, if you don't forgive, your body knows that you are keeping a grudge. That's what there's a hormone in your body known as cortisol. It's like a stress hormone. When you are trying to not forgive somebody, it builds up, builds up, and the more you have it, the less your immunity is effective, but it has an immunosuppressant property can suppress your immunity. So imagine when you have it a lot. One single cough in the train, you're sick. Because your body can't even fight it. And it will shorten your lifespan. So when you're forgiving someone, you're doing yourself good. You're pulling your own lifetime. So I want you to dig deep in your heart. How many people have wronged you that you're sick or holding a grudge? I want you to genuinely, not pretentiously, genuinely choose to forgive them. Amen? If you're not doing it for their own good, do it for your own good. So at least you can live long. And again, do it when you still have a chance to do it. I have a friend who we'll close with this story. I had a friend that the father wronged him. He left when he was small. And he couldn't imagine why the father left him. This bog, bogged his mind. Finally, when he met the man, he, the father tried to come back into his life. But it just happened that when the father came, tried to come back to his life, he was very rich. He had a lot of money. So he like, how dare him? Come, he refused. The father did everything to, you know, he refused. He wanted to punish the father for what he did. Long story short, the father died. And this brother had been miserable ever since. He lost the ability to forgive the person while he was still alive. He, he, every day he wished he could go back in time. And in one of those times, I said, okay, I forgive you. So the person you are holding a grudge for, you may not have the chance to forgive them in future. So while they are still living, while you yourself is still living, you owe it to yourself to forgive the person. But it will be shameful for you to come to God, and God looks at you and says, wow, your garment is really, really dirty. Say, so how? With unforgiveness. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit divine, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word has given us life. I pray and ask, O oh Lord, that we will not just be hearers of this word, but also doers of this word. 
give us the grace to be able to forgive everyone that has wronged us. We just don't want to pretend that we forgive them. But Lord, give us a gift to genuinely forgive them. And Lord, we are, it is possible, give us the strength to reconcile. Lord, I pray this day that every heart of stone in us, that you exchange it for a heart of flesh. And give us a grace that not just to forgive once, but the grace to constantly forgive at every time we are being wronged. In order to represent you in our day-to-day activity. Have thine own way. I let my hinder you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder, for guiding us through the special lesson of forgiveness. And also for reminding us of the profound blessings that can come from a life rooted in faith and forgiveness. So as we conclude, I'd like everyone to stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. You be seated. i